would please come to order and stand for our invocation. Let us pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you for this night that we can come here in this place and assemble with the freedoms that we enjoy. We thank you for the citizens that are here. We thank you for our community and what it means to each and every one of us. Help us to have the wisdom and the guidance that will bless us in our community to help build your kingdom. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Remain standing as we pledge allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Gentlemen, you have the agenda that is before you. Uh, we do need to add a closed session uh, as request of the manager for general statute 143-318-11 to consult briefly with our attorney. Uh, that being added, are the other additions or changes to the agenda? If not, do I hear a motion? Do we make that change and approve the agenda? Make a motion. Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor, aye. Aye. Those opposed? The agenda has been established. Our first items of presentations tonight will be the uh, Public Power Awards of Excellence. We'll recognize Mr. Earl Botkin and our city manager both for this uh, great achievement. Botkin. Thank you, Mayor. Recently, the town was one of 19 power, uh, public power communities across North Carolina. Uh, to receive awards of excellence in, in various categories. The town of Smithfield won these, uh, won these uh, awards in uh, energy efficiency, financial stability, and the service excellence. These awards are presented annually by electric cities to those public power providers who do a pretty good job with, uh, with uh, uh, striving to provide the best service uh, that they can. Uh, in the uh, the back of your your sheet or, or the next page, whichever whichever it have to be with you, there's a there's a list of uh, uh, criteria for ever ever award, and it, and it has criteria for winning the energy efficiency award, financial stability award, and and uh, the uh, service excellence. Uh, and these these are the awards. Uh, sample one. You're very, very, very nice, very, very suitable to hang on the wall, and, and I'm sure that uh, the town manager will find a suitable place for them. But just briefly to tell you what uh, the town did to, to win these awards, what service that, that we provide to win these awards. On the energy efficiency uh, award, we all we have a very good time of use program. It is for residential and commercial both. It is. It is. Well, well, well used by the customers, and, and that was that is a very, very good thing toward energy efficiency. We also offer a co peak program for our uh, large and, and medium uh, industrial customers and the commercial customers, which is which is a or again a, a very good tool for energy efficiency. We distribute energy kits, and very often they, they go to the low income and, and the elderly, and it, they're they're very well received when, when they are distributed. Also, we, we do a really good job in encouraging energy audits. We do several of them. Well, we don't personally do that, them every year, but uh, Electric Cities has, has those on staff that do that, and, and we, we do request several energy audits every year for, uh, for our customers. <coughs> on the Financial Stability Award, uh, some of the things we offer that, that uh, Electric Cities thought was very beneficial, we offer budget billing, and we also offer audit, audit draft option. We, we offer credit card payment and, and debit card payment. We are currently upgrading our billing and financial software, which will, will really uh, be far more robust than what we currently have with Logics. And uh, we, we may offer uh, in the future online, online bill payments, which is something that's often requested and hopefully someday in the future we, we can offer that. On the service excellence uh, uh, side, uh, this, the, these awards are, are for, for those who, who keep good communication 
with uh, with our customers. We offer uh, uh, billing inserts. Uh, we we see, do billing inserts frequently. We have our web website that uh, thing, uh, information is posted on. We have the PEG channel, and also our uh, recent uh, electronic newsletter is a very good way of getting uh, information out to a, to the public. So if, unless the council uh, has some other ideas, I'll, I'll bring these, uh, I'll present these to the town manager in the morning and he can distribute uh, these to whomever he likes and, and hand them. And I think they're, they'd be good for display. Thank you, Earl. Uh, Mayor, I'd just like to say, uh, I'd just like to commend um, Mr. Botkin and um, his staff in particular. Um, you don't always hear good news about um, power agencies and power providers, and you know it's a tough operation. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about the rates, both uh, locally here and also across the state, with the merger of two large uh, providers. And it's just good to hear that um, when we do do some things correct, that uh, we, they get the recognition for it. And Electric City does a good job in trying to you know maintain that um, that high service, but give our local governments who are in the business as we are, you know, that give them some motivation uh, to work hard and it's all about the customers and the stability of power and one thing that doesn't really come through as, a, as an award in and of itself is just the stability of provision of power. I mean, our rating is somewhere around the 99.9% .9 of, of stable power. That is, when you turn your light switch on, the lights come on basically. And even during storm outages, when there's a line that goes down, our ability to get the, um, the electricity back up and flowing again uh, is really second to none. And that is one of the unique things about having a smaller power company that's able to respond to its system uh, quickly and efficiently. And I'd like to uh, thank Mr. Bakken and particularly his staff for their hard work in doing that for us. Thank you. Okay, our second item of presentation is uh, for the 2011 and 2012 audit report. I recognize uh, Ms. Mills and also the manager for a key in on that, if you will. Mayor, actually, uh, it's going to be Ms. Phyllis Pearson is going to present the uh, audit from Petwed Mills and Pearson. And also uh, uh, Ms. Hogan, our finance director, she'll be here for any kind of more specific questions dealing with our day-to-day -day operations in the finance department. And Mayor, um, I don't know the exact tradition uh, for presenting the audit um, in Smithfield, but um, basically this is your first look and the staff has seen at least a draft version of this audit but this is the presentation of what we think will be the final audit i think uh, Ms. pearson is going to indicate that we're still waiting for approval from the lgc because they've backed up a bit across the state um, for their reviews if there's any issue that arises during that review certainly we'll come back and um, and take that into account we don't anticipate any problems there but I think it's going to be uh, Ms. Pearson's intent to go through, summarize uh, the findings, and also answer any question that you may have, and just present you uh, a brief summary of the audit, and then also give you a chance, you know, over this ne these next few weeks, to review in detail the audit at your leisure. If you have any questions, to send those to me, and I'll get those to Ms. Pearson, so she can directly respond to them for you. It is a big document, something you can't really digest uh, very quickly, and no one um, expects anyone to be able to do that. So if you do have any questions, we'll be happy to follow up uh, with specific answers for you. Thank you, Ms. Pearson. Thank you. Pages 6 and 7 in the audit report is the independent auditor's report. We have issued an unqualified opinion on the statements in that we found them to be in the generally accepted accounting principles. In accordance with government auditing standards, we conducted this audit under the um, yellow book, which means we've looked at your compliance with grants, laws, and other matters, contracts, things of that nature. That opinion has two findings, and we'll talk about that when we get to that point in the audit. We um, reviewed the management's discussion analysis and the schedule of funding of progress for the employer's health plan and for your law enforcement officer's plans. We do not issue an opinion on those um, items. We look at them, we reconcile them to financials, but we don't do sufficient work to permit us, and we're not permitted by professional standards to issue an opinion. The supplemental schedules and the schedule of federal and state awards that's in this, that are in the back of the report, 
we do test those in sufficient detail and audit those numbers and we have issued an unqualified opinion on all of those schedules as well as the statements. And if you would look at page 20 and uh, 19 and 20. This is the statement of net assets and a statement of activities on the full accrual basis of accounting. And what that means is the fixed assets, the accumulated depreciation, and other non liquid assets are recorded. And then long term debt is recorded. Uh, in your fund financial statements, which is typically what you use for your decision making, those items are admitted. You had $45 million in total assets and government activities, total liabilities of $18 million, and total net assets of $27 million. In the business type activities, you had total assets of $31 million. Total liabilities of 7.9 million and total net assets of 23 million, so that the total asset, total net assets for the primary government on the full accrual basis of accounting was 51 million dollars. If you look at the statement of activities, these statements include depreciation of compensated absences and other items that are not recorded in the financial statements. The total expenses were 38 million. You had charges for services of 29 million. You had operating grants of 489,000, capital grants and contributions of 239,000. And then you had total general revenues of 9.8 million, so that there was a change in net assets of 1.1 million. There's a prior year adjustment in these statements of 1.1 million. That occurred because there were errors in the financial statements as of June 30th, 2011, in that utility revenues omitted the June 2011 transactions. And that's why that number is as large as it is. Because once you go back and book your 12th month of utilities, that changes your beginning equity. So the ending equity was, was $51 million. Page 21. Is the governmental funds. There were total assets of $6.9 million, total liabilities of $568,000, and total fund balances of $6.3 million. The total fund balances in the general fund were $2.2 million, and the fund balance available for appropriation, the unassigned number, was $250,000. And then the, what happens at the bottom of the statement is we reconcile it back to the net assets on a full basis. Page 22, this is a statement of revenues and expenditures and changes in fund balance. There's total governmental revenues of 14 million, total expenditures of 14.8, and the revenues are 14.2. So there was a loss on an operating basis of 184,000. And then there are total other financing sources of 5.2 million, leading to a change in fund balance of a little over $5 million. The general fund was affected by the prior year adjustment to the extent of $52,000, and that leads us to ending fund balances of $6.3 million. If you looked at page 24, these are basically the same numbers I've just gone over. What is significant here is budget overages. Um, interest and other charges were not allocated between principal and interest in your budgetary process. Going forward, you need to adopt that procedure so you don't have budget overages showing on the schedule. In the statement of net assets, the proprietary funds, the electric fund and the water and sewer fund, had total assets of the 31 million, total liabilities of 7.9 million, and total net assets of 23 million. The revenues in these funds, the operating revenues is 25 million, operating expenditures 23 million, operating income and loss 1.8 million. Then there's other operating revenues and expenses with it being negative of 180,000. 
so that the change in net assets was $1.6 million. The majority of the prior year adjustment does affect the electric and water and sewer fund, and that's what we would expect. That is a little over a million dollars, so the ending net assets are 23 million. Pages 27 and 28 are point in time statements, and what they're really showing you is that in the water and sewer fund, cash increased $1.2 million over the prior year. You have an agent, a couple of agency funds. The total assets, I'm on page 29, is $307,000. There was total liabilities of $881,000, so there was total net assets of $307,000. These funds had limited transactions. There were um, $6,000 in expenditures, and that leads you to the total net assets at the end of the year. And if we could... Look in the back of the report at the <coughs> compliance opinions. They start on page 71 and 72. The government, under government auditing standards, there are two general statute violations, and accordingly, we're required to report those items as findings. What they do, those findings deal with, is you're required to have 8% of your general fund expenditures set aside in unassigned fund balance. That number would be $1,067,000, roughly. You have $250,000. So you're going to have to have in place some best practices to control expenditures and build those fund balances to the statutory requirement. And one of the second finding deals with the prior year adjustment in that whenever an error is identified that's a material error in, in government accounting, that's over $10,000. We are required to report that as a deficiency in the accounting system because the expectation is that the financial records will be accurate. So we think you've got in place procedures, new st staff and staff with the skills to ensure that these type errors don't occur. Your staff did identify to us that that was in fact an error. So um, we want you to be aware of that. We conducted a state single audit. That means we've done compliance testing of the terms and conditions of the Powell Bill money. And that is an unqualified opinion with no findings. So that, that you did well in that area. In reviewing the prior year findings, we go through and we do similar testing. And we have uh, some things that are in this one single page letter you have, where we have taken feel like procedures are in place and the situation is really a bleed over from the prior year of some of the eras. Um, we noted that for whatever reason you're not having the uh, post-employment liability and pension assets uh, valued by an actuary in every third year as required by government accounting standards. So you need to contract with an actuary and catch that up so that 2013 you meet the state as well as the uh, government accounting standards, GASB's requirements as far as those studies are concerned. We examined personnel files, uh, quite a number, and um, we noted some of those files were very similar findings to last year, not as many though, in that the documentation was not complete. One would expect to, unless you went through and audited those files and had everybody fill out missing documentation, that you would have that same comment in the current year that it's going to carry over because it takes two of the three years to work through documentation. We noted that the compensated absences are not being recorded in the enterprise funds. Since the enterprise funds, that's water and sewer and electric, are maintained on the full accrual basis, those liabilities should be recorded monthly. We also noted some immaterial over expenditures in the general fund and the general fund capital projects that um, really they're minor, it's $151, $1,803. The budget should have been amended before those funds were expended. 
So you really need to monitor the budget to actual closely and see that you're always in compliance with that general statute. Questions? you explain the, the, the third thing that you mentioned, crude compensated absences, absences were not reported in the enterprise fund? Okay. Uh, sure. Okay. Um, each month, you in your Logix accounting system, it, the amount of vacation pay that's a liability for the town to pay whenever an employee terminates is accrued in a module that's separate from the general ledger, and you have to pick up the balances from that module and make a journal entry and post those transactions to the enterprise funds, and that process didn't occur. It has been corrected for purposes of this audit. Questions, Jim? I do have a question going back to page 22. And bear in mind, we, we, we have seen this at 7 30 tonight. So. Sure. Um, on page 22, uh, revenues, total revenues were rounded off 14.6 million, mm -hmm. and expenditures were 14.8 million. So that means we actually operated in the red. And, and, and what caused that, if you look at the general fund capital project, it is running in excess. It, almost all of that is attributable to that project and the cost of completing it. So there's timing differences and things of that nature involved with the capital project. Uh, if you look over in your general fund, you had positive net income of 420,000, and then the net change in fund balance once you've added in the, co the proceeds from the sale of capital assets is 425,000. So that fund is operating very well. It is typical to see a capital project operate at a deficit until the project is actually finished. So page 22 is the capital projects. Well, it's 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 everything. It's, incl it's everything. So that number is included in the totals. I see. I see. The capital projects fund actually operated seven hundred forty-five thousand. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, so it's influencing it heavily. to the next section of our agenda for public hearings. We have two public hearings before us tonight. And I'm going to ask that anyone who wishes to be heard on these public hearings, which is the conditional use permit for Omnisource, as well as the rezoning request for Mr. Bird's property, to please stand and let our clerk affirm you at this time. That way we can make sure you're all uh, recorded as being on record. You will, if you want to speak on any of these behalves, please stand at this time. You can just stand right there. Yes, sir. If anybody, anybody wants to speak for or against this, if the applicant is here, the applicant needs to be sworn also for both projects. Yeah. 
the applicants will need to come forward and be some more. Put your stand and confirm the name. Thank you very much. Mr. Embler, I recognize you, and gentlemen, we'll call you up as, as dean, okay? You have a seat back. Thank you. Okay, our first public hearing, and I'll uh, have a motion that we open this public hearing. First, second. Motion to second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Public hearing number one is open. Conditional use permit. The applicant is seeking a conditional use permit to construct an above ground fuel tank on Gibby Industrial Zoning District. Property considered for the approval is located on the west side of Wapat Road, approximately 350 feet south of the intersection of South Bright Leaf Boulevard, and further identified as the according tax record ID. Mr. Embler, I recognize you to start the public here. Hey, backing up just one step uh, for any in the audience that were here, uh, when the public notices were mailed out, there was a one notice also for ESA renewables for the solar farm and also the town of Smithfield Farmers Market. Those hearings, uh, those cases were withdrawn and will be held next month. Okay. Um, it, referring you to page 28 of your pamphlet uh, where we're talking about this staff report, just to give you a little background on the um, Omnisource Southeast. This is locally known as Atlantic uh, Scrap. This is in the Walpat Road near the East River. Uh, it's a 41.1 acre nine uh, track. It is heavy, zoned heavily heavy industrial and it's for metal recycling. Uh, the purpose of this conditional use permit is for an above ground fueling station, a 10,000 gallon tank to fuel their own equipment. Uh, the zoning immediately to the north is B3, to the south is R20A, which is the land basically across Interstate 95. East is uh, heavy industrial zoning, and west is R20A. Um, staff analysis and commentary, uh, the plan is, uh, the request is in consistency with the future land use plan, has identified this area as being suitable for heavy industrial use. Uh, it is consistent with the Unified Development Ordinance in that above ground storage tank is a permitted use within the heavy industrial zoning district provide, providing there is a conditional use permit issued by the town council and the compatibility with the surrounding land uses. The proposed above ground, above ground fuel tank will be within the interior of the existing industrial complex. It is unlikely that negative impacts on existing and future surrounding areas will occur. Landscaping and buffering, no additional landscaping will be required due to the fact that it's the interior of the parcel. And signs, no additional advertising signs will be used. Uh, the town of Smithfield provides fire protection for the property and also provides water and sewer and electric. If I might reference you to the map, would you have a copy in, uh, in your uh, packet? We have a wall pack road. We have the railroad, we have Interstate 95, and the News River. This is the property of 41 acres by Omni Source, and the location of the fuel tank is where I place my finger, which is uh, some 300 feet off of uh, Walpack Road. Um, the condition of approval. Uh, staff is recommending uh, the following that all state and federal regulations concerning with bulk fuel storage uh, fuel must be met or and a conditional use permit shall be uh, null and void if they're not met. The planning board at its December the 6th, 2012 meeting uh, unanimously voted to recommend approval of the proposed conditional use permit with a provision that state and federal regulations associated with bulk storage fuel facility would be met and that it would be null and void if the conditions for those uh, federal and state requirements was void. So with that, the town count, uh, the staff would like the town council to consider uh, the approval of the conditional use permit. Any questions for Mr. Inman? I have a question. Isn't that the facility that uh, has had some fires in the past 
that for whatever reason uh, they were not able to put out quickly? Uh, to my knowledge, that is the case. The, it's been several years ago, three or four years ago. The fire chief could probably address it much better than I. That, that, and, and I think I'm right in saying I looked through the zone commission and they, they didn't bring that up that I saw. But that would be a concern I would have about having above the ground tanks out there. There's actually been more than one incident. There's several incidents. I'm just questioning whether that's appropriate to have those out there when they have uncontrollable fire. Stand, I may stand corrected, Mr. Evans, but wasn't there a water loop issue that was added to that since uh, there it is on behalf of the fire is represented? Uh, I'm not sure exactly everything, but after the last fire, there was some substantial improvements made with water loops and uh, standing deluge guns that are in place permanently. And uh, we've had no issues in the last, since the last fire, which is three years, two years, three years ago. Was that fire within this area where these tanks are going to be? No, I'm not sure where that's at. I mean, they, talk, talk to see that they have been reviewed by uh, Harvey Jones of the fire department, and to his knowledge, there are no issues with it. My recollection, um, uh, Councilman Harris, is that the fire occurred in the vicinity of the shredder, which is more of the rear of the property, and this is up toward the front. And um, the, um, the shredder, and correct me if I'm wrong, the tank is here and the shredder is back here. So there's a fairly substantial distance uh, in between them. Basically, I believe this area, there's a maintenance building immediately adjacent to it. And I think primarily the area up front is used for receiving trucks, bringing in materials to the site. So the actual processing is to the rear of the property. <coughs> and I, if I, and I'm not a fireman by any means, but my understanding was the reason why the fire was not quickly contained was primarily due to supply of water. Uh, they, they just couldn't get the water there quick enough. Yeah. We had the capacity of having to show the water in Thank you. They did at their expense. Yes, I Any other questions for Mr. Evans? Is there any, uh, it may be a state regulation, pollution control insurance when you have a tank like that? Uh, there are certain state regulations, and uh, I believe the Department of Agriculture regulates those regulations, but I'm not familiar with them. I, I do know that that's why we have the clause in there, that they must be compliant with state and federal regs, and, but I'm, I'm not familiar with that. You can answer. Do you all have insurance, pollution control type insurance in case of a spill? Yes, and our, we have an environmental department, so they're in charge of the all locations. We have like 40, 40 locations in the southeast. Uh, and actually, the manager of uh, that department on, on this uh, location. And he's, uh, he's you know, informed about this project. And uh, we're all public. Uh, being the applicant, being here, is everything that he's presented tonight as accurate and as you would have it be presented? That's correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there anything you wish to add? Mr. Temple, let me ask you another question. I noticed these tanks uh, in the uh, brochure that we got about these tanks. It says that they are easily moved. Uh, this uh, approval, approval of this uh, will they be required if they have those tanks specified in the area location that we're agreeing to, would they have to contact us before they move or relocated those tanks? Uh, yes, my experience, there's really no easy way to move a 10,000 gallon tank because uh, of the footers that have to be provided for the tank itself. Um, I've been, done several 10,000 gallon fuel storage tanks for the military and they're um, 
when I was in private consulting and there uh, there's a lot of weight associated with them you just don't put them on the ground they're on four concrete footers but so <coughs> the answer is if they made a decision to move them they would have to come back to us yes you are approving this tank for that location and it, they would also if they moved it they would also have to get a building permit also because it would require running additional electrical to the new location and that always triggers a building permit okay anything else in this then we move to our findings of facts you see each one on page 36 oh before we do that let's close the vote here do i have a motion of a close vote here, I move close vote here. second motion is second those in favor aye aye those opposed thank you mr Ashley. now you see on page 36 the findings of facts uh, evaluation form uh, we can go through each one of these if you'd like but i think the recommendation of Mr. Endler says is to adhere to state and federal law, laws and regulations which is incorporated into the findings. I would move that we, I move that we approve in the affirmative for all four findings of fact. So, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor aye. Aye. Those opposed? Being that the second prong of that is that therefore based on these findings that we grant or deny the following condition with the following conditions uh, do i have a motion that we grant Make a motion that we grant the request. second a motion and a second that the motion be granted all those in favor aye aye, aye. aye. opposed thank you very much okay our second public hearing uh, is request of rz23 by mr ca bird do we have a motion to open this public hearing Second. Motion is second. Those in favor, aye. Aye. Those opposed? Consider us open in this public hearing of the rezoning request. The applicant is seeking to rezone a .50 acre tract of land from a R6 residential to a B3 business zoning district. The property considered for zoning is located on East Market Street, approximately 280 feet east of the intersection with Future Way and further identified as Johnston County tax ID number as listed. Uh, that being said, Mr. Ember, I recognize you as... Okay. Uh, if I might start by referencing you to the map over here where we're talking about the property is, uh, you go under the underpass on US 70 East heading toward the community college toward Interstate 95. You come up to the rise at the top of the hill just beyond uh, the, the street that turns to the right in Belmont. Um, this, there's a tract of land. Presently, it is comprised of seven separate tracts of land as part of the rezoning. We're asking that there be a recombination plat done, and the seven plats will be recombined into one plat. So that would be one of the conditions that we'd ask for. Um, is the area that's outlined in green here that we're talking about. This is the property that was formerly known as the New York Market. It uh, caught fire two, three years ago and was partially destroyed by fire. It has been uh, reestablished now. The, the um, I believe the Johnston County Building Inspections has uh, finally passed it off or it, in the near process of passing it off. It was posted as unsafe after the fire and uh, it has been being worked on to bring it back into standards. Um, our ordinance as written says that after a use ceases to exist for 180 days it must uh, come into compliance with the current code which uh, is why we're here tonight to present this is that the um, it was obviously out of use for more than 180 days as a commercial piece of property. It was zoned and has always been known as far back as we could research town records. It was zoned residential. It was never zoned commercial. So the first order of business, if it is to go back into commercial use, is that it has to be rezoned commercial. Therefore, the request for the commercial rezoning tonight. So a little bit of history to getting you to this point. Is that clear? 
Okay. It's, uh, as the mayor said, it's a half acre track. It's presently zoned R6. It's being requested to be rezoned B3 commercial, which will allow for general highway business retail. Um, no specific site land development plan may be discussed uh, in condition of the zoning. In other words, the zoning has to stand on its own. You can't talk about what's there or what's going to be there in the future. It has to be what does, will the zoning stand on its own if that building was there or not there. Uh, environmentally, there does not appear to be any environmentally sensitive areas on the property uh, considered for rezoning to include floodplains or designated wetlands. The uh, adjacent zoning to the north is B2 and B3. To the south, it is R6, residential, single-family residential. East, it is B3, and to the west, it is R6, single-family residential. Uh, staff analysis is concluded that uh, the proposed B3 zoning district and uses permitted in that district are consistent with our strategic growth plan. This was the plan that was done back about 10 years ago that looks into the future of where Smithville needs to be and that area was shown to be commercial. Uh, consistency with the Unified Development Code, rezoning the property from R6 residential to B3 business will serve to correct the zoning map to more accurately reflect the previous and future land use and its conformance with the town and for Unified Development Ordinance. The compatibility with surrounding land uses the property considered for rezoning is located in the uh, existing commercial corridor and the proposed rezoning should not create any incompatibilities with the exception of the adjacent residential properties. Fire protection is by the town of Smithfield. Um, the uh, town serves it with water and sewer and electric. Uh, the findings in connection with the legislative decision on rezoning West, the town council may consider certain approval criteria uh, and, it must be, and that is attached for you to review there's eight items. Uh, planning staff recommends approval of the, uh, the map amendment because the proposed zoning will serve to more accurately reflect the existing conditions and use of the site. The planning board at its December the 6th meeting voted in a 6-2 vote in favor of recommending the approval of the rezoning request. Uh, the next few pages are the application prepared by the applicant. And if you'll turn on over to page 53, you will see the approval criteria. There are eight items there uh, that you must take into consideration in deliberation of the rezoning. With that being said, that's the end of the staff presentation. I stand for any questions. Questions from Mr. Amber. The house, the residence, that is immediately this side, I guess immediately west of the former commercial structure. Yes. It, that is occupied as a residence right now, isn't it? My understanding is presently occupied as a residence. It will be separated from the par property as part of a recombination and it will be a standalone residential property. It will remain R6 residential. That is not being rezoned. And that, that property is also owned by Mr. Burke. That is correct. Yeah. I, 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 read what, I read the packet and I read and I heard your statement about no site-specific land development may be discussed. I went by there Sunday and the structure goes all the way back to the road behind it. It would be impossible to have any type of buffer, wouldn't it? It would be very difficult. It could be a partial buff, buffer in the staff's opinion to the rear, but not a total buffer. Immediately to the east of this property, there, look, there appear to be concrete pads of, of some structure that used to be there. There's a service station over there on the other side. Are there still underground storage tanks out there? No. Mr. Emerson. Yes, sir. Did uh, Mr. Bird approach you about rezoning this, or did the town just decide they wanted to get it rezoned? 
uh, by our ordinance, he was required to rezone it if he wanted to continue in a commercial use because it had been out of use for more than a period of 180 days. Normally, uh, he could uh, ask for it to be rezoned and tell what he wanted to put there. I see he don't say anything about what he wanted, what type of use he want. And normally what we do is when they request a rezoning, uh, we can rezone it, but on a conditional use. And what we're doing is saying rezoning it and no one knows what is going to go there. Well, the council could have the opportunity and I would defer to the attorney on the legal aspects of it, but you, the council could rezone it to B3CUD, which is a zoning district, conditional use district, which means that he would have to submit plan as well as the rezoning that would be considered as one thing. Well, the thing of it is, I, it seems like it's the town more or less uh, trying to rezone this instead of him, because I haven't heard him say where he wanted, what he wanted to put there. The reason, the reason it, 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 it's, it's like this, it's so near, just like Mr. Asher said, there's no buffer, there's no buffer between uh, that property and Street, Federal Street, which is directly behind it. Not only that, you, you want to do this as a business. Uh, the peoples cannot get in and out, egress and, and egress out of Belmont in a safe manner now. The town is trying to get, saying they want to correct this property. We need to be talking about how we're going to get in and out of the Belmont area. And see, and what has seemed to happen now is everything is continuing to encroach upon this community from the west side, the east side, and everywhere. And the citizens really uh, don't have a way of feeling that uh, the town is protecting them. It's, we're looking for everybody else. We're trying to do something for everyone else. Now, sure. When this man purchased his property, he knew where it was. Uh, even though whenever he put it, it was out of service, in most places you come back if he decides what he wants to do and ask, and we could give him a condition to use, but what we're doing is just saying, no, it's going to be business. Okay, what happens whenever you put a business there on, and the business is going to go all the way down to Finnell Street? And what really happens is it don't be conducive with the neighborhood. And the, and the neighborhood is right there, it's facing it. And most likely they would, if any, if any business you put there, uh, the people living on that street will be facing the back of that building at all times. And not only that, if they decide that they, they won't deliver it and everything, They'll be delivering stuff in front of their front door. This is not even, this is not even conceivable to be uh, a, a good way. And, and, and it, it seems to be that uh, the town would think more about trying to preserve the Belmont area for residential than it would be trying to get it into business. Especially this area here. That's why it's here for your consideration tonight. Well, in my consideration, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the, uh, you know, most of the citizens here don't even know anything about what's going, really going on until, you know, they come up here and here. And, and, and most places, most neighborhoods, when you start to doing things like that, they are notified, they have an input into it. These citizens did, it's already before the town. And I don't think this is a proper way that town should be conducting bidding. As, as part of the public hearing, I'm sorry, Mr. Charles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. As part of the public hearing, Mr. Bird, is what uh, Mr. Embler has stated on your behalf accurate? Okay. You wish to add anything? Okay. okay. Please take the podium if you wish. Uh, Mr. Williams, I would just like to. No, have you talked to any of the people over there about the school? Okay. Uh, I, Mr. Bird, hold on just a second. 
stick to the rezoning issue if you will okay because that's what we're here before before us okay well Is there anything you wish to add about the rezoning well he's brought up the neighborhood right okay there's no one in that neighborhood that hadn't requested for it to be reopened as a convenience store. And for their convenience. And it's been one. I bought the property in 66. And I believe the zoning started about 68. And that building was there before the zoning. Why it was ever zoned residential, I don't understand. But. The neighborhood is on me to do it. And as far as that neighborhood, as long as we will buy any house over there and rebuild it, as long as the inspection department will let us, instead of them turning down and then it's empty lots and they'll tell you over there, nothing's never replaced. And we're working on the houses over there to do that. <clears throat> working on what the neighborhood's asking. And I don't understand all this. Is there uh, anything about the zoning different than what Mr. Embers has stated? I don't think so. Okay. But, well, uh, I, and I, I just want to make sure you, you understand the up here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yes. Mr. Mr. Embler, I do have one question as far as notification. Uh, what's listed in the packet, uh, adjacent property owners? Were these were letters sent out to the adjacent property owners that are listed in the package? Were they sent registered mail or just? No, they are sent first class mail as re, um, as uh, allowable under state and general statute. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from this <clears throat> Anyone else that has been sworn on this matter wish to be heard? Above here. Sir, if you will please state your name and address for the clerk, I would appreciate that. Uh, my name is George Curry, and my residence is uh, 1513 Virtue Drive, Oxon Hill, Maryland. But I own properties in Belmont. Matter of fact, I own properties behind uh, Mr. Bird's stories. Now, what I like to just say is, when that store was there, it was hard for me to keep a residence in my rental property because traffic from that store came through my yard, dropped beer bottles, liquor bottles, uh, not liquor bottles, but wine bottles, so uh, all kinds of paper and trash on down through the back towed the fence down and made a path through there. So it was traveling constantly through there along with drugs. And the house was broken in a couple of times. And the residents moved out. They would, they would, I could, it was hard to get anybody to, to stay in the house. You know, and that was a problem. Now, since the, the building's been boarded up, I got people living in the house. We don't have any problem. No problem. No problem whatsoever. Now, I'm not saying that it, it was Mr. Bird's fault, but I'm just telling you the facts. This is what happened. Now, it's, it's a whole lot of other people that's in here. They, don't want, they probably don't want to say anything, but it affects them too. That's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Let me ask one question. That whole neighborhood back there. Yeah, it is. It is. No, That's what I'm saying is. No, no, I'm not blaming you. I'm saying, I'm saying your, your, your store is not open. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Are there, um, you finished, Mr. Denver? Anything else you wish to add? Okay. Question. Yes, sir. Question for Mr. Ambler. You, you stated that 
We could put a condition of use on that. Did you not say that earlier that we could put a condition of use that Mr. Charles asked earlier? The, um, the intent of what the use of that building would be? Let, let me explain that a little further. Um, B3 zoning, if the council so elected to rezone it as B3, any use allowed in that would be by right. It's allowable in our zoning code. We have a, a table of uses that are allowable in the B3 district. And that means that a convenience store is one of those items. It could be in there as well as uh, offices could be in there. There's a number of different things. B3 is the zoning that's all the way out uh, Bright, Brightleaf Boulevard, for an example. B3 CUD or conditional use district, it's still basically the same allowable uses. However, it's specific to a given plan that he has to, the, the developer has to provide. In other words, you're not only approving the rezoning to B3, but you are also approving his specific plan for how he's going to use the property. And in that landscaping, parking, uh, buffers, you know, all those things are conditioned. That's why they call it a conditional use permit or conditional use district. Uh, that is the uh, the council's other alternative in a rezoning issue, as opposed to B3. The, uh, the, the owner's request was B3. In, in order to get the CUD, would that have to be another filing, or is that something the council could do at this seating, or would it be a denial and then a reapplication? We could just make it part of a motion. Hold it. Hold it, let's don't get confused here. Mr. Bird has not said what he wanted to put there. How are you going to make a condition of use and say condition of use if he haven't said what he wanted? One, the request for you would be approved. There's what? no requirement. In fact, it's illegal to talk about the use if you go there as a matter of law. We can't talk about it. Another option in the council, I believe, um, they don't have to zone B3. They can zone it. The public notice has gone out. They can pick in another zoning, and another zoning is D3 conditional use. But there won't be any discussion tonight about the actual use. It would just be zone B3 CUD conditional use. And then if Mr. Bird decides to do a business of one nature or another, he will come back for just a conditional use here. Wait a minute. This so this. That, um, this is this is this is, you 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 gonna tell me that you're gonna come and want to rezone something you can't discuss what's gonna go there. People can't don't even know but what's you gonna go there. We all have been for the last fifty years. Well it, it don't make no difference. Here's the yeah, thing. It, it, it do make a difference too though. It do make a difference when you gonna we're gonna sit here and decide to rezone a place and then come back some other time and then say, well, you can do this. Okay. You rezone this to business. Next month or the month after that, someone else is coming and say they want a business. The whole area is already encroached in. Uh, is is already being encroached on, and people just like uh, the gentleman was saying, he I cannot. We saying, cannot. They cannot this. live in a in a community. I, I understand where, that, but you're making an argument that I mean, it's very very clear. The request is for rezoning to B3. The council can apply another zoning. But we cannot talk about a specific use of that property. We cannot do that. Okay, well, I, you know, I, I'm that's saying the, the B3 as a conditional use, again, if that's an appropriate option to rezone it tonight, I'm telling you what that means. That means that the applicant will get that zoning, and you have to come back for, when the, he determines the use, come back for conditions to make that use viable. And some may be appropriate, and some may not be. But right now, the applicant has requested B3, and that's, what he, and that's, that's, the, that's the request to the board tonight. The board could say, well, we prefer another rezoning, uh, or it could say we don't like that rezoning, or we like that zoning, and, and vote on it. But we can't, we can't manipulate it and get an actual use out of uh, the applicant. That's, just, that, that, that's improper. And that's, but that is, I mean, those are, that's what's before us tonight. Well, that, that's the, the, the issue I'm bringing up. Then if you can't talk about what you can do with it, then we deny, and whenever they bring it up, or whenever they decide on what they want to put put in there, then 
we can talk about you can't, it. But you can't deny it just based on the fact that you don't know what is going to put it on there. You have to deny it. There's eight criteria in this package. Well, there's some that criteria. That you have to consider. And you have to consider in good three, every conceivable use, good ones, bad ones, that you like or don't like. And if you don't like them or think they're inappropriate for the neighborhood that's there, then you that would be a factor in saying, I don't think a dry cleaner is or whatever may be part of B3 would be appropriate for the neighborhood. I don't think it's an appropriate zoning. And then on one of those criteria, you would, you would vote you know, vote against it. And then there would be a vote by the whole council to say that zoning in that area is, is not appropriate. But you can't deny it because he's not telling you what he's going to put there. That's improper. Well, I brought that up. But the issue I've got is that anywhere you, you, you put um, you change from residential to um, business or whatever, you have a buffer <coughs> zone there. You have a buffer. You buffer the people. You don't just take and, and, and have it where the people can run in. And I'm trying to explain to you what, what, what it is. That's the reason why is we need yeah, to get that. The B3 has many buffer requirements that when there is a, if there's a business that's going to go there, they have to meet those requirements. Um, that's, that, that is a requirement. They have to meet those, whatever those are in the code. But they don't come back under a straight B3 for conditional use. It would just be they have a list of, as Mr. Amber indicated, a list of uses that can go there, and they have a list of requirements for landscaping and other buffer requirements. If, if you were to rezone this property to B3 CUD, the council has to approve the plan that it's on it. And if Mr. Bird next month decided to change the plan, he would have to come back and ask you for permission again. Staff cannot approve it. Only you as the council can approve a plan in a CU district. The problem is, it's not so much as just with his property, but it's the thing about it. The town and the whole area is being changed from residential to business. And, 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 and when you do that, and, and when you do that, there's no way to separate the resident from the business, and and that's what I'm trying to tell you now. So, it, in finding, you can't do it, Mr. Ashton. You know, <clears throat> part of our job, one of the reasons the, the citizens elect us to be up here is to protect the citizens, whether they come to speak before us or not. We also have a, a duty, I think, to respect the rights of a property owner who wants to go into business. This is a transition area. It is a unique area, the way it's laid out. You've got the major thoroughfare, you've got a, sh a very narrow block, and you've got Fayetteville Street right behind it. I think the best way to deal with this transition area and to look after, try to look after everybody is to look at the B3 CU. That way we can see what type of buffer will be put up, what kind of, how we could protect the residents. If you, if you said you went over there. Yes. Uh, you in mm -hmm. Did you drive back on Fairfield Street? I did. Did you see the part of the building was just about it? It is. It is. Okay, now what, how, what are we going to talk about a buffer? That the will street? require a fence. When you come back, you require a fence. In other words, if the citizen don't, don't, it's not in this equation, it's the businesses that's eating up the citizens. How would you like to have to go to, I mean, you, you've been in your residence. Now, if it was somewhere you was, you was moving to and you had the option, these people have been there all their life. I understand. And now you're going to tell me you can to do something, you just stick a fence up right in their front door. Said that was an option. I didn't no, say that's it, what we Well, do. I mean, that shouldn't even be but, an option. You know, but, but for an unfortunate an fire, option. that business would have stayed in business all these years. Well, it, that, that you've got a chance to regulate. Yeah. Okay, the public hearing is still going on, and I this gentleman wish to be heard again. Very briefly, sir, if you will. Yes, sir. I guess I'm a little because now I work in commits, and I work in rezoning. Now, from what I understand, when you apply for a permit uh, for rezoning, you state what you're going to do or what, what kind of business is going in. Now, if you, if you apply 
for something to be rezoned from residential to business or commercial. On a permit, it asks what kind of business you're going to do. I mean, what kind of business you're going to put up or what's going up. Now, how, how, how is it that you can apply for a permit and don't put what you're going to do? Thank you, sir. Mr. Mr. Bird, would you agree to continue this 30 days and maybe talk and have a neighborhood meeting? Well, now we should go to even friends and find the way this is going. Do you want to continue it 30 days and see if we can work this out? I think the board doesn't move. But if we the same business, that we to the exception, we will not have gas. I'm sorry, but we got it. Again, it's just at this point, it's not. It's not proper. I know you're trying, trying to help, but it's not going to help. I called the Okay, we have a call to question. Uh, we need to close the public hearing. Do I have a motion to close the public hearing? Second. 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 Those in favor, aye. Uh, opposed. Okay, the public hearing is closed. So, discussion or well, motion would be a thing. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. We do need to look at the. Uh, Section or page 53, it's a little something new we're still doing here. Uh, this is not the findings of facts that we had on the first one, but we can go through each one of these uh, if you so choose. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, can I interrupt you just a moment? I, Mr. Ember's still up there, and I do want to ask him a question. Mr. Ember, I've been in Smithfield about 20 years, and my memory is that building has been there at least that long. He says that he bought the property in the 60s. I don't know when the building was built, but there was a business there for many, many years. And I'm now finding out it was on residential. Is that correct? It was on residential. Mr. Burr, after he bought it. After he bought it. Mr. Hammer, let me ask you a question. How is it possible that there was a business in a, in a residential area in the city. Was the city, did the city approve that building or the building of that building? Or how, what's the history on that? The original, at the time the town of Smithfield adopted zoning in 1968, there was no planning department. Matter of fact, I don't think we even had a town manager at that time. The Division of Community Assistance from Raleigh, which is a state agency, zoned Smithfield at the request of the council. That ordinance was established and adopted by the council in 1968, which was after the date Mr. Bird had said he bought the property in 66. I can't say why it was zoned R6. It was. I moved here in 76, and it was a commercial property in 76. It was obviously wrong uh, at the time of the original zoning. We found no record of any rezoning in that area to correct it from R6 to business at any time in the past. This is the first rezoning activity we could find. I mean, there is none. But the zoning was a commercial use before there was zoning in Townsendfield. The, the zoning was R six. No, the, the use was commercial. Was commercial before there was zoning in Smithfield. I can speak to 1976 because that's when I moved here, and it was a commercial property in 76. So, so it's been that way for a long, long time, and it has been residential. It sounds like you knew that it was residential. Uh, how can someone get a business license to operate a business now, now this, in a residential area? Very, very easily. The zoning, it was used for business before there was ever zoning. And then some group that really came in and said, let's zone Smithfield, and they called that one residential. Who knows why? Because everything was around it was residential. Probably incorrectly, doesn't really matter. That's where the grandfather use of a commercial enterprise would, it would keep going. So it wasn't like, it was improperly, it was a non-conforming use basically, but it would have been grandfathered in or other terms and always had a commercial use. Basically. It had been, it had, they had been houses that people had to be. Yeah. Somehow or another, somebody right. come up there and get a place. 
Yeah, yes. you know, the Knox side. Yeah, I'm not sure but the it was, exact dates, but it sounds it like it was commercial when that change took place and, it, and maintained and continued as commercial for many, many years. So that's why like, when they came back for a license, there was license, existing use, non conforming, but that's a legitimate use as many of those are right. Okay. Yes, sir, we have a call to question. Also, close the public here. Are there other discussions? Yeah, there is a discussion. You know, I've been talking for the last five years of trying to get someone to hear me just to say, hey, let's put a, a street over there so the people could get in and out of Belmont. And nobody paid that any attention. But all of a sudden, we, we, we had the town coming up saying, well, we need to rezone these, these, these places. So in other words, you know, the people that pay, pay tax and, and stuff over there, uh, they're just wards of the town. They're not really citizens because, you know, uh, everything can be done. And now we can come in tonight and, uh, you know, really disenfranchise the citizens and say, well, we're going to do something and they, nobody can submit to what's going to go on there. And so later on, and he knows it's be complicated to continue these things to continue moving on. The next time you know, the whole area will be full of uh, businesses. And citizens will be the ones that's left out, called out. But yet and still now, when they get the taxes, they'll get taxes and they'll have to pay their taxes and they'll be really serious taxes that they pay. I'm quite sure they have to pay taxes equal to what is paid everywhere else. But yet and still, whenever it comes time that we should have been really giving consideration to the fact that these are areas where it needs some considerations, uh, everybody else get the benefit and these citizens don't. And I, and I certainly uh, understand Mr. Williams' concern and, and, and the concerns of the neighborhood. But quite frankly, with Highway 301 coming through there and the businesses that are coming in, the new sheets that's coming in, all the businesses that are just coming in, that, that is a business district. And we as a council have said that we wanted to improve that area so that we can bring businesses into that area. The chamber is actively working on projects to recruit businesses to come into that area. Um, so, you know, uh, it's a business area right there on 301. And, and I agree with Mr. Williams and the concerns, no doubt about it. And that's why, I mean, I would, I would definitely recommend if we do anything um, to do a uh, conditional use. Because that way, at least we can put some kind of restrictions on it. And if there are buffers needed, then the plans can be brought before the council. We can look at it and we can make the decision at that time whether to approve the use or not. Um, but, but the fact of the matter is, is that unless I've heard the council incorrectly for quite some time, we're working to try to bring businesses in to fill in that area because it's sitting there vacant with just concrete slabs on there. And in my opinion, you know, well-maintained businesses would be better than big concrete slabs or boarded up businesses that, you know, um, if he can make improvements to the property um, and have a viable business, it may bring other business owners to come in and, and, and develop around that area. But right now, they're looking at a boarded up building. Um, I certainly understand this gentleman's concern about the traffic, uh, the foot traffic coming in and out of there. Um, but quite frankly, I don't know if that's associated, like you mentioned, I don't know if that's associated with that business or not, or, or what it is, but, um, you know, hopefully that's changed. But I, You see, first thing, you, you continue to talk about businesses. It's a residential area, and not only that, they was people's considering uh, improving the community, but how are you going to uh, uh, improve a community when you are uh, devastating? I mean, and, and the community is at its lowest stage, but it's being improved gradually. And, uh, you know, you would think the town would be willing to, to, to say, well, this is one of the old neighborhoods and old areas. Uh, let's see what we can do to help improve on that community instead of uh, you know saying well we're just trying to make business and once you, you once you turn it into business and what kind of business are you gonna get there? 
whenever you get someone there, if you get a community store, the only profit they can make in there is basically beer and wine and things like that. And that's a detriment to the community. So uh, what we need to be thinking about is trying to improve the community by putting some I, I guess my question is, is what kind of residential property are you going to put there? And who's going to do you it? You could get any kind of residential property rather than put a, a bit trash. It's been residential since 1966. It's on residential. I don't see the first house there but one. No, maybe they don't have to see there, but you don't have to take. You, you're never going to have any more residential areas. Uh, you're not going to create residential areas. You're going to only create business areas. Why you want to take down the, the, the little? And you know, and it's not that? just this area. And I understand it. No, but you don't understand. When I, yes, I do. When I lived on Third Street, um, four houses away, I sat up here on this council and approved the frame shop that used to be residential, but is now a business. I approved the financial building there um, at the creek that used to be residential, is now business. I approved the, the, the doctor's office there at the corner of 3rd Street and Church Street that used to be residential, okay? That was a neighborhood I lived four houses away from it, but I approved those for businesses and control because I knew that those properties would just sit there and be vacant. What and as me as a citizen and living there, I'd much rather see what's there now, a nice doctor's office, than just a boarded up buildings. That's a big deal. You know what? Look <clears throat> at the area over there now. What is that? When it, whenever the business was open, what did it do? It only created undesirable people there in that community. It, that's what it, it, it created. And when it, if you do it again, that's what it's going to do. You, all you're doing is continue to move the community into a disarray. Okay, gentlemen, we need to look at this. <clears throat> In those comments, we need to look at this uh, criteria on page 53. If there's something in any of these, I do see in item six, if we want to take them collectively or we can read them individually. Uh, if there's a changing, we've heard mention of the different zoning of B3CUD, that would need to be alluded to in the motion. Um, or if there's any other suggestions, we'll go through it. Rather me take them one by one. Take one by one. Yes. Okay. The zoning petition is in compliance with all applicable plans and policies of the town of Smithfield. You see the response here. The zoning petition is in compliance with the town of Smithfield UDO, which calls for property to be within the commercial zone district if commercial uses are proposed. I think that is an accurate statement, and it is in compliance with our UDO. You don't have to make findings of fact on, on this zone, okay? So you can listen, you can read through those and they can help you make your decision. But you don't have to make any findings of fact about it, you don't have to vote on it, any of them. You just got to decide what you want to do. And you're sitting as a legislator on the judge. So if, if you want to uh, change this to business conditional use, you need a motion and you need to do it. Now these kind of criteria would help you make that decision. Well, I'm going to read through them if you can stop me if you'd like. The zone petition is compatible with the established neighborhood and pattern of surrounding area. The East Smithfield Market Quarter is predominantly commercial in nature, and any request for rezoning to a commercial zoning district will be in keeping with the uh, development patterns of the East Smithfield Quarter. That's stop right there. That's not so. Okay. Keep that in consideration as your motion, Mr. Williams, as we go through this. The rezoning petition in number three is compatible with the changing neighborhood conditions that might warrant a rezoning. Previous use of the property was commercial in nature, and the change to commercial zoning district will serve more accurately reflecting previous and proposed uses of the property. Not so. The rezoning request is in the community's interest. Rezoning, so. okay. Let me finish reading for my rezoning to property to B3, or whatever designation the board should choose, 
will be a community's best interest because the rezoning will allow the highest and the best use of the property. Not so. B3, CUD. Okay. No. All right. The request number five does not constitute spot zoning. Small scale zoning can be considered reasonable given the property is located in the commercial quarter and the existing structure and previous uses were commercial in nature. That's not so. Okay. Item six, present uh, regulations deny or restrict the economic use of the property. Present uh, regulations do, do not allow for commercial uses within residential zoning districts and rezoning to property to B3 or CUD, which has been alluded to another item, will allow the wide range of uses that are currently only permitted within the B3 or the B3 CUD zoning district. Item seven, the availability of public services allow considered of this rezoning request. All public services to include water, sewer, police, and fire protection will be available at or near the site considered to rezone. Item eight, physical characteristics of the site prohibit development under present regulations. There are no physical characteristics limiting the property. However, the site is currently zoned R6, and the zoning request was B3. Most occurred prior to staffing issuing the site plan approval and land use zoning permits. I'd like to change that to B3. Hearing those uh, statements, is there a motion on the floor? Or can be, can be made? I'll make a motion. Okay, we have a motion. A second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. Okay. B3 CUD, which requires, as we've already mentioned, come back to us for whatever conditional use that the person will be doing at that time. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, public comment. Anyone wish to be heard? Mr. Johnson, I think you wish to be heard. <laughs> I'm wearing two hats tonight, um, one as a, as a citizen, but also uh, someone that markets the town and talks about quality of life, and sometimes I think that uh, we as a community um, and as a town, our own worst enemy, not, not necessarily knowingly. But um, a lot of times, that, and I'm not here to, to uh, say that our electric rate is too low. Uh, we all know that it's, it's high, but, but I want to make sure that the public is aware of the fact that it's not as high as the perception out there. And the reason that I state that is what I've given you before, or what I've just handed to you. It's basically, this is a copy of my electric bill, and um, the total bill is $250 for the month of uh, September. And um, I had a friend, and we were talking about it over coffee, about, and he lives in Pine Level, about his electric rate. And a lot of times, I think when the citizens are saying, what's your electric bill, is that they're just looking at the bottom line when they're talking about water, sewer, garbage pickup, everything. When in reality, even though it's right there in front of them, it's tough to disseminate and, and separate out. So when you're talking to somebody in another community or out in the county saying, what's your electric rate? You just know, I mean, I couldn't tell you, but I know last month I paid about $250, you know, to the town. But in reality, my electric rate is a whole lot less than $250. And the purpose of me showing this is just to make the council aware that that this house, even though it's a, it's they're comparable in size, the uh, the utility rates is very comparable. Um, is this the house in Pine Level is a little bit larger, 
but for the most part is is right in line with everything else and even though um, I guess what I want, would like to say is that we need to look at ways of educating our public to know exactly what their electric rate is as opposed to um, everything else is being grouped together. Um, and I've discussed this with several council members of the possibility of, I know that there's, it's convenient to send out one bill, and, and, but I think if there's a way of, of, uh, of doing this different, I think that it, we would have better understanding and also our citizens would be able to compare apples to apples when they're talking to other <laughs> citizens around the county about exactly what their their electric rate is. I'm not necessarily coming here for an answer tonight, but I just want it was just one of these interesting things that when you when you talk to people and say what's your electric bill, um, it's uh, so anyway. So I just went, went did the homework and, and asked somebody that lives in another town that's uh, that obviously is in, in Johnston County, and uh, even though our electric rate is a little bit higher than uh, than, than ours, it's, it's not end of the world that is often portrayed and uh, anyway so I just want to make sure that I'm proud of our community and I just want to make sure that we're we as a town and as a council and a government that we're doing everything to put our best foot forward and, and, and positioning ourselves and showing maybe a more positive light that the cup is half full instead of half empty so I'll be more than happy to answer any questions but I just wanted to <laughs> Mr. Johnson, did you calculate the difference in the kilowatt hours used? Comparing I, do, I do not, but I can tell you right now. Were you now, aware that the Pine Level Bill used 59% more kilowatt hours? I do not, but I know, that they're, I know that their water, sewer, and garbage is higher than ours. <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a trade-off for, you know, living in town, and obviously we've got other expenses and stuff. So, and I'm not here to say that we should start raising our electric rate. That is not the intent. But, but I think we're beating ourselves up or, or giving people the tools and the perception that our, that our, that our cost of living here in Smithfield is, is more outrageous than what it is. Yeah, Chris, really is. I, I appreciate you doing this because I've, I've said this on many occasions, even though Mr. Ashley is correct as far as the kilowatt usage. Uh, it was about 800 kilowatts more in, in pine level than this. But, but still, to your point, it's something that I've stated, and I actually stated when Electricities was here, I made a comparison of one of my friends who lives out at Holt Lake in a uh, much larger home and compared their electric lake rates to ours, and, and, and it's exactly people, the point people, that I mentioned. When you're talking to somebody that has this under the progress bill, they're just looking at their progress energy. That's bill. exactly right. And when you talk to somebody in Smithfield, they're looking at their entire bill, which includes water, sewer, and everything. We're having ours grouped together. Theirs is separate, and they don't put theirs together when they're making the argument of, or making the decision for that point of where to live. Yep. And the point is, is that I think the way that we're, I should say billing, but the way that we're presenting our case and presenting our bills, is, it's sometimes confusing and sometimes to our detriment. So. It's a very good point and a good example. You need to be complaining about the, to the county about that thirty-one dollars and ten cents sewer service. That's a lot. Anyone else in public comment wish to be heard this time? Too long. Okay. No more public comment. Then we'll move to the consent agenda. Do I have a motion that we approve the consent agenda? Only five dollars and twelve cents. I don't think that's correct. Motion to have a second. Then we approve. Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor, aye. Aye. Those opposed. Going to business item number one. Uh, consideration to approve a grant application for the NC Rural Center to benefit the adult daycare center proposed on Highway 70 Business West. Find that on number seven. Um, Mayor, if I could ask uh, if Chris would mind uh, joining us back for this application. He's worked hard with the group uh, who's involved here and um, has helped with the uh, matching funds. Uh, Mayor, you may recall that we've, uh, we've been working for several months now with a group that um, is St. Joseph of the Pines. They have a facility presently in um, uh, Fayetteville. Mr. Ember and myself uh, visited that facility some months ago. They were interested in um, opening up and renovating the Haley Myers building on the west side of town and they're, they are moving forward. Um, they have a contract on the property 
Um, they're set to close uh, in the early part of, uh, of this year, I believe sometime by the end of February. And so we've met with them and, and gotten them this far uh, in the process. Chris has helped them. Um, he's tracked down and he has found uh, this loan with North Carolina Rural Center that will help them with the renovation of, um, of that building and that parcel. Um, the project, um, and there's, there's some, there's some kind of rough numbers out there, but it looks like when I talked to him, uh, the manager in the Fayetteville office of a similar size facility, they said they would start off with the 20 to 25 medium to high paying jobs. And then as they, um, this service they provide is for adult daycare, kind of an eight to five operation um, where they visit and they provide services for um, uh, senior citizens. Um, as they increase their enrollment, that number could ri uh, rise to well over 70. They've even put as much as 90 employees in there. And again, most of the jobs in this, in this facility are medium to high paying jobs. There are a, a number of uh, lower paying jobs, but the percentage is not a bunch of low paying jobs as there are sometimes in retail and just one or two medium paying jobs. The brunt of these jobs are medium level income jobs. There's a great operation down in Fayetteville and um, the purpose of this uh, item being on the agenda is to request your approval of this grant application where the town would merely serve as in some of the more recent applications as a flow through entity. Um, as the applicant in name with the, um, the, um, the, the group, um, St. Joseph of the Pines, really doing most of the administration along with Mr. Johnson and DSDC um, in terms of the administration. And also there's been a request which has not been um, um, approved yet, but so far it's in, um, it's in friendly, a friend reception from the chamber that the required 5% match or $12,000 um, may be funded by the Smithfield Selma Chamber, but we'll know that before the grant is approved, if it is approved, and before we have to sign any contract with uh, the North Carolina Rural Center um, to go forward with the grant. And again, um, I'll let Chris address this, but the, the reception so far from North Carolina Rural Center has been very positive. There's a good chance this would be a big help for that business. And again, this would be another example of the town along with downtown Smithfield trying to help a business get to that next step in this tough economy. So my recommendation, um, assuming there are no questions or if there are any, we'll try and answer those, is to make this approval and also approve the uh, resolution that was passed out right before the meeting. And with that, Chris, um, if you have anything else to add or any details that may be helpful to the council, I'd appreciate your help on this. I apologize for the delay in not having this into the packet. We were working over it over the Christmas holiday. We met and had a conference call with the Rural Center. Um, we had initially were going to apply for the North Carolina Building Reuse Grant, but the grant that they've recommended and steered us toward uh, is the Rural Center HOPE Grant. Uh, this is their recommendation that we apply for this, so that just leads me to believe that we would be looked. This project would look favorably on it. Um, it's uh, like Mr. Sapson said. It's uh, they're we're, they're applying for uh, uh, about 50 jobs for the grant for 50 jobs, uh, and the average uh, salary for these jobs is $53,000. As we have pharmacy. Uh, there's going to be. It's basically going to be a, a whole network within that building. Obviously, if uh, if things uh, go well, then you know, future expansion is always a possibility. Uh, the building has been vacant for since Hawk Myers has been filed for bankruptcy, which was in '96 or '97. Uh, so I think this is a golden opportunity uh, for a small investment. And, and like Mr. Sauter said, it's my intent to uh, petition the Chamber of Commerce uh, to cover the 5% uh, percent, percent match, which would be $12,000. Okay, gentlemen, you've heard the request, and before we make a motion of the approval of the grant, I would like to make one motion, if it's pleasing to the Council, to add the resolution 517 and also the letter of support, if you would allow me to sign that. The, the grant application is due tomorrow. That's we've we met uh, in the conference call over the Christmas holiday, uh, several days before Christmas, and really trying to push this through. And um, and actually, the grant is. I'm still receiving information from, uh, from St. Joseph of the Pines. I've received some information today, 
I'll be gathering all that and submitting it for tomorrow because the deadline's tomorrow. Well, I said to the council. Motion to approve. Second. That, is that motion including all? All gathered. Gather. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Uh, item two, the authorization to allow budget amendment of ESA renewable deposits. Um, Mr. Bakken, I recognize you on that item. ESA Renewables of Lake Mary, Florida is proposing to construct a 1.98 megawatt solar farm near the town's Brockton Road substation. ESA has requested permission to make our substation their point of interconnection for getting this solar power on to the electrical grid. There are significant uh, expenses uh, for such needs as feasibility studies, uh, interconnecting agreements, lease agreements, legal fees, you know, just, uh, any assortment of, uh, of uh, legal fees that might be associated with this. And they are typically paid by the developer or the building's the, the, uh, builder. It is customary for the developer to make a deposit to the municipal of $10,000 to cover expenses with, rem with anything that's left over at the end of the project to be refunded. The finance director feels that a deposit of, of this nature requires a special budget amendment to satisfy the accounting requirements. The proposed amendment is as follows. On the revenue side, we propose to, to uh, increase miscellaneous sales and services uh, from 25000 to 35000 And on the expense side, we propose to increase the expense uh, of professional fees me, from 13000 to 23000 I move we approve the uh, request. Second. Okay, motion is second. I have a question. question. Has ESA Renewables Sign a contract on that piece of property yet? Is there, are they under contract? No, no, sir. I don't, I don't believe this is just the preliminary work, and and until we know whether it's even feasible or not, I, I don't think they will, they can go for the. You talking about the land acquisition? Well, the land itself. We we recently got ourselves in a situation that cost the town uh, a lot of time and effort and money. On a situation where there was never a contract signed, we went way down the road for a long time, with a lot of hard work, and that's the reason I asked the question. I don't think we should be addressing things like this unless we know for sure that someone is serious and has actually signed some type of a contract to go forward. Mr. Chair, I'll tell you, I've spoken with the property owners, I think on two occasions, and I was going back about a month, month and a half ago. They seemed really close to being on contractual terms, but I cannot say they have not, they have not indicated to me that they were. I know one of the property owners actually is in the real estate business. Um, I would be surprised if they weren't, but I cannot state, you know, for the record that they are. Well, I think what we could do is if, if there's an inclination to approve it, we could make it, um, you know, no other activity or action by the staff or anything unless there is a, uh, a contract presented on it. Um, not that, that's my point. I, I would ask that that be added to the motion that uh, Mayor Pro Tem actually made. But if it's not feasible for them to tap into our substation there, is there any point in buying that piece of property and building a solar farm? I think that's kind of the point of this money is to study the feasibility of doing that. Well, they would be under contract by that property. Um, not necessarily. I mean, I mean, my point is we should not be spending any time dealing with a, a, a maybe. Now, if there's nothing required of our staff other than just passing this, I don't have a problem with it. I thought we were just receiving a check and we needed to budget the check. And, and if that's the case, I have no problem with it. I'm asking that question. This doesn't require us to do anything other than to approve this except the check. There's no due diligence or no work that we have to do or Earl has to do on this project. That's Bob's staff. That's the best of Bob's. 
There's very little. I mean, you, and you may know that the, um, the applicant, ESA in this case, they ran the, um, the request for um, rezoning annexation through the um, planning board. I think back in maybe December or November, and yeah. it's on hold. It's on hold pending this. Yeah. So there has been some work in that. Of course, that's just another applicant for land related to another grant application. A lot of time. I think. Um, I think the work will be little, and I certainly, uh, given that, I think if that's if that's the in in inclination, it'll be easy to keep it very limited. As you say, just very procedural. You know, change the budget, accept the money, fund it through Pro Ser Power Services, who typically does these studies. Um, with minimal uh, activity or you know collection of data off staff until they're ready to proceed. Do you say it's okay with that the motion and the second will have uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, sir. Are they going to be selling electricity to CPNL or? No, it will be it will be third be an entire purchase agreement between uh, ESA and uh, the power agency. Okay. All right, so they're dealing with the power agents. Okay. Okay. Uh, business item three, consider of the proposal resolution number 515, uh, declaring vehicles and equipment of surplus personal property and approval of electronic auction and surplus personal property. Uh, Mr. Manager. Mayor, um, the materials you've got, you've received, and also there was a supplemental amount from the Public Works Department uh, with some additional items that were placed on there that should be included in this um, in this presentation. Uh, but you've got a list of surplus items that the departments have submitted, and the North Carolina law requires us to actually vote to surplus these items, uh, present them to the council, and that's what the resolution that's attached uh, authorizes. The declaration of the surplus, uh, in many cases, vehicles and other large pieces of equipment, and it also authorizes the staff to sell it by electronic public op op um, auction uh, through govdeals.com, which is um, the preferred vendor and used by many, many local governments uh, for these purposes. So again, the requested action is to declare surplus the vehicles and equipment and then authorize staff to sell the items uh, that were declared surplus through um, electronic public auction using gun deals. Any questions of the manager on the surplus? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Second motion. Second. Motion is second. Those in favor aye. 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 Opposed? So be it. Uh, item four, consideration of resolution 516, opposing legislation that provides for the force taking of municipal water supplies. Mr. Manager. Mayor, this was a resolution that was sent to us um, by the North Carolina League of Municipalities recommending that we weigh in on this, uh, and they've asked uh, many, many cities that uh, operate water systems throughout North Carolina to, uh, to take a similar action. And the materials attached indicate that there was basically um, some legislation that was being discussed and considered um, that would basically transfer existing water assets of the city to other um, entities um, and to restrict or eliminate the ability to operate municipal enterprise in ways which locally elected officials um, we deem, that we deem beneficial to the taxpayers and the ratepayers um, to, to our basically within our discretion. If you see the resolution that's attached, it's 516, it opposes legislation that provides for the forced taking of municipal water systems. And that's what you've got in your packet. Um, I believe this would be a, a statement. I think there are many, many I've seen on the listserv, uh, local jurisdictions that are uh, adopting the same proposal. Basically, it maintains the integrity and our ability to control our own water system. And I would ask for your support on this. Allow us to, um, to adopt this, execute it, and then we can send it in to be considered by um, both our local delegation and the rest of the North Carolina General Assembly. Okay, any questions for the manager on this request? Do we have a motion? Make a motion that we approve the resolution. Contrary to what our um, all-knowing paper states, I'll second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you much more. Item five, consideration of the contract award for the <coughs> sales and service. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, you see the attached information. Uh, basically, it's uh, we're just it's, uh, it's time to renew or issue a new contract for our uniforms, primarily for public works and utilities. A couple other departments, uh, like in Parks and Rec, use a handful of uniforms. Basically, this was um, um, 
proposed, uh, received two proposals from um, vendors in the uniform business, and there were some there were some ups and downs in the proposals. Frankly, uh, some some in some areas were more expensive than others. But after getting the recommendations and the um, the input from other uh, users um, of the competing vendor. Um, the references were strong um, with the Unifirst group that we do presently use and the staff uh, and primarily again public works and utilities felt comfortable with using Unifirst and would like to renew with that contract and stay with Unifirst, Unifirst um, as our uniform uh, provider and as you know they provide the uniforms they clean them replace them when uh, they become worn and damaged and we'd like to ask for your permission to renew that contract and under the proposal it would just be a year-to-year -year contract I believe the last Last contract was for up to three years and we'd like to contain that to uh, just a year that way if we are unhappy or want to change in the future we have a little bit it's a little bit more time when we can make that change okay. I've heard the requests are there any questions I, I, I look this over and, uh, and I look at Airmark's bid and, and it, it, it could be a whole lot more expensive though it doesn't show the papers mm -hmm. but I think based on what I read the quality of the uniform we're currently using is I don't know if the will pick up on it or not but I would make the motion we approve it okay. I'll second that motion is second all those in favor aye aye, aye. aye. opposed okay. my report will be very brief uh, reminder of uh, the retreat dates that's been set up for through the clerk. If those who haven't contacted the clerk, please make sure that those dates are appropriate. Uh, what are the 31st and the 1st? Yes, sir. The 1st and the 1st. The evening thereof. And uh, I think the managers arranged uh, some facilitation uh, for that meeting that will help us stay on track. And, and please give him some items, agenda items, if you would, he's requesting that you would like to see on that retreat. Uh, there's a number of items that we have discussed, the manager and myself, that has carried over from last year based on your request. And uh, so please give him input uh, for that meeting. Um, also on the 28th of this month, we have our annual chamber event. Uh, you may see some invitation from the chamber on that. Please plug in if you can on that. Uh, also on that date, uh, I have asked the local mayors of this uh, county to come here around 4 o'clock and to 5 o'clock and uh, Congressman McIntyre will be here to talk about the issues of this district to help us discuss what may be on the table for our area. Uh, we'll do it very informally and the mayors will be here on that date on the 28th. Uh, also has asked that um, he would like to do a meet and greet of our citizens sometime in February uh, as a congressional caucus here. Uh, you might have seen his swearing in today. Uh, also gave two locations of, uh, I guess you'd call it offices that he's had. Uh, I've asked him to come to Smithfield and look at the possibility so that we can have close niche with our congressman uh, in Smithfield and he has taken that into consideration as well. So, will be more discussion on that, but I think it's important that we work with our delegation on all levels and that we can uh, see how we can improve federally our highways as well as anything else that makes it our area. Um, I've talked with the manager on several other opportunities I mentioned on the retreat, some of which he's got in here in his conversation very briefly, but I'll defer to, to him on those. But we have a lot of things going on, so please uh, plug yourself into those. Uh, I do want to thank the staff publicly uh, through the holiday season uh, and the decorations and the thing. I saw Chris out there moving Christmas trees. And you're not going to hit the stoplight, though, are you? Okay. Uh, but uh, got all the decorations down. The grounds crew, who after parades and all the events, Lenny, the crowd did a great job. Uh, Earl, thank you for everything y'all did. Fire and police as well. But uh, it was a great season, and I just want to personally thank you publicly. Um, that ends my report. Uh, are there any council comments? Yes. Okay. Uh, it seems though, uh, right here on Seven the Highway, you put the old cement uh, 
cement plant used to be. We started having the trucks stop there, dropping the trucks and stuff off. See if we can get this thing correct. Okay. Uh, they need to go to the truck stop. Okay. Good point. I've noticed two or three out there myself in the last week or so. Uh, Chief, can you work with uh, planning and, and that group and make sure we uh, cover that? Sure. Thank you, sir. Other discussion? Any other council? Mr. Manager, I recognize you for your report. Yeah, a few things. Uh, you've got my written report, and I'll try to get through uh, the items pretty quickly. I want to skip real qu uh, quickly to item number 11 um, while Chris Johnson is still here. Uh, there's been a request um, from uh, DSTC, the director, if he could join basically our our health insurance, our primary health insurance that we provide to our employees. There doesn't seem to be a problem with him doing that. Um, either Chris or the DSTC, whoever's uh, responsible for the amounts, would pay all amounts with that, just become part of our plan, basically, to get a better rate, take advantage of that. There'd be no cost to the city at all, and um, it would save the Chris and or DSTC funds on that, and basically there's no problem on the group side of it. We spoke with our, um, with our, um, our broker on that and he didn't highlight any issues that would be a problem with that but I'd like to run that by the board again we would uh, charge a monthly amount to uh, to Chris and DSTC for that and they would pay that on a monthly basis not a big issue we could flag any problems that would be great from that any, any comments or questions I, I think it's a good idea my only question would be which sounds like I've already addressed is legality of being insured as an employee when you're not Right, and you know, it was one of those gray areas, to be honest with you. You know, we called around, and many, many, Chris has many of his friends in the same business who are either play, uh, paid, contracted, or whatever um, through the municipality, and they have the same separation as a downtown Smithfield, and they're doing that, and um, have had no problems with it whatsoever. Certainly, if something flags or come up, I mean, Chris would understand it would, it would stop, and we did talk to our broker, and they said they, they did not have problems. We think we can do it, and, uh, but you know I think uh, everyone understands that you know we are again kind of a flow through on this, just trying to help with the system. I think what what people look at is the fact that they are doing you know they are doing the business of government. They're just doing it kind of by contract and, and fulfilling that role, and that's enough to get them in under that umbrella. But yeah, it was a good point, and that's what we can talk around for several days and talk about it. So we'll get something to right. Well. I think uh, we can do it as a contract um, if you think that's required. A letter, yeah. a letter that would be fine. Just to say that they're responsible for the penance. Yes, the city bond insurance company is not going to deny the coverage all of a sudden, right after you get sued. Okay, that's what I would want. A letter on insurance company. What's that? I'm talking about. He's talking about from the, the carrier. I don't want a letter from the carrier. Oh, okay. Making sure it's okay. This is where we're okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on, uh, Mayor, I think there was a lot of news about the fiscal cliff and the avoidance thereof um, that was resolved uh, about two days ago now. And just for the, the Council's um, education, the only impact really to, to the town was not financial, it's just adjusting the payroll tax. And um, as I'm sure you've heard by now, basically the amount went up from, went up some 2% or 2% total, that is from 4.2 to 6.2% uh, will be the increase, which is, you know, that's, that's just the result. Um, so we're having to change our payroll, adjust, adjust our payroll accordingly. It does not cost the town anything out of pocket. It just means there will be a little bit less uh, money that we take on for the employees. But we've already made that adjustment. It was effective for this paycheck that went out this week, actually based on the fact that it went out in January, effective uh, you know, on that January day. So we've already made those changes. There might be some things to work through, but we think all those have already been put through the system and we're already uh, in effect for the paycheck that went out or when it's by wire transfer today. So that, that has occurred. And so far, that's the only adjustment we know that we have to make out of our payroll. Have we made the education to our employees of why it will be decreased 2%? Yes, sir. What we did is, and as you know, most of our, um, most of our uh, Paychecks are automatic are on automatic deposit into the uh, the employee bank account, and we give them a pay stub, you know, a, a receipt basically every pay period instead of an actual check, and we attach a statement explaining that that was going to happen to give them a heads up so they would know. Um, 
So um, I think everybody kind of knows something's afloat out there, and we tried to explain it, you know, as clearly as we could, um, so they understand that it would be a slight change to those uh, to those pay checks. Also, uh, Mayor, uh, I think we, there was some discussion last month about the North Carolina Supreme Court ruling, uh, and as it impacts the internet sweepstakes business, basically, and that ability to run those uh, that software, those games on internet um, parlors, basically, and there were, um, I believe, five operating in town um, at last count. Um, that went into effect with the, uh, with the ruling uh, about some 21 days ago, went into effect actually yesterday. Um, there's been not much happening since it did just go into effect um, yesterday around the state. Um, what our course of action, what I would like to do and, and will do starting Friday or Monday, is I'm just going to give a notice to those businesses that are concerned that the Supreme Court has declared um, that operation illegal. But in my opinion, that doesn't necessarily shut down the business because they're internet rental businesses, at least most of them are, which is a, arguably a legitimate activity. They just can't run the internet sweepstakes games that have been under scrutiny for so, so long. So, uh, you know, I think some are taking a more aggressive uh, role in just trying to say, you're shut down, you can't do that. From my standpoint, it's a little bit like a restaurant who serves food and, say, alcohol, and they lose their alcohol license. Well, they can't serve alcohol, but they can still serve food. Now, effectively speaking, I think that in the end of the day, most of those businesses make the most of their income off the internet sweepstakes games, and so I think that will have an impact, you know, on their on their their revenue. But that's out of our hands. That was a North Carolina Supreme Court decision based on North Carolina statute. We can't do anything about that. So I think it will still be a little bit of a slow rollout, but um, that is my plan, really, to, to give those business operations the business that they can't do the gaming internet any longer, but we're not necessarily going to pull the privilege license. The question becomes when they continue to do that gaming, if some do, um, and they still have their license to, to do the internet business in general, um, at that point, I think we have to look at pulling the privilege license and taking other action, hopefully with the help of uh, the local law enforcement or our, our police department and other state agencies that would enforce that. I have not gotten any word from the Attorney General as far as how they might be able to do that or assist. But I think that's pretty much the approach. Uh, it looks like most local governments are taking, are going to take, are rare taking, or will take in the very near future. But I want to give you a heads up on that. A okay. um, couple quick things on the Smithfield crossings. I won't go through the detail, but there is um, trying to respond to the to the request for a little bit more detail on the project. I'm trying to divide it up into the Part A, which is basically the ramp off of 95, and the Part B, which is more of the off in industrial park. Some of the activity that, that has occurred in the last several weeks on that project, and um, that summary is there for, for your review. Paul, oh. yes, that Smithfield Crossing project, I, I may have discussed this with you, I cannot remember. Um, but there's some scuttlebutt going around town that I've heard from, from more than one person that Smithfield, the city of Smithfield is not paying the contractors. And I don't know how many contractors there are out there, but could you uh, just assure me that that is not the case? Yes, sir, I, I can, but I want, I want to make sure, and I, I think I understand where that criticism uh, uh, may be coming from or the, the, the crux of it. There has been some difficulty with the contractor providing us with the appropriate documents to get paid. You know, we can't just get a document and just say, hey, here's a check and pay them. We have, you know, we're funded by the Rural Center and other groups, or Rural Development and other groups that have incredibly detailed requirements before they're going to pay and authorize the payment. So we have to get the, the detailed information about the work that's been done. It's got to be categorized, guys, categorized properly. It's not easy. I'll be honest with you. It's not easy. We have to review it. Then we send it to the Rural Center or Rural Development for its approval. Then if it, if it meets the requirements, they approve it. And then we issue the check uh, from our bank as part of our loan package. Uh, we have had some problems with um, one of the contractors in getting that information uh, together in the right form. And that has caused a problem. We have met with them repeatedly. We've even tried to do it for them, tried to help them out as much as we possibly can. So I think we've done nothing but try and help that process, you know, but typically in local government, no good deed goes doing unpunished. 
uh, and sometimes we still get criticized for a slow payment. But we're trying to meet the requirements of rural development and do it the, the appropriate way, and sometimes that slows it down. And then subcontractors, they try to get their payment from the contractor. The contractor says, well, the town hasn't paid me, and then everybody's on the street talking. The fact of the matter is, we have turned around many of those bills in a matter of a half a day or a day when they're appropriate. Sometimes the response is, look, your math doesn't add up. You have to do this again, and we wait two weeks, and it comes back, and it's still wrong. So again, we're trying to do it as quickly and efficiently as possible, but there are some, uh, it, it, it's a difficult process. It's not as easy as some. But that's the reality of it, but I can see what that might um, is it might create. Is it because of the payment Um. I think the contractor has, I mean, I think to their credit, they've tried to work around some of that. I think they've had some trouble with subcontractors, which from our standpoint is their responsibility. We would say, well, we're not going to do work until we get paid. And they say, well, we're not going to pay you until the town pays us. And we tell them, we're not going to pay you until Rural Center gets the paperwork properly completed by the contractor. And then the work is delayed as a result of that. I don't think that's a regular course of action, but I can't say that has, that has not happened. So. Um, but again, um, a lot of it's very easy to point fingers, but um, we have tried at every effort to speed that up and, and keep it going. I don't think it's caused any kind of major delays. And as you know, sometimes when you can't work in one area, um, for instance, when we're trying to get some of the condemnation property, get that squared away, they're able to pick up and move to other areas. Sometimes the timing is perfect. As you know, they stop during the holidays to stay off Industrial Parkway to uh, non the businesses. But as you can see in here, they're able to go in some of the uh, proposed H streets and other areas and, and, and do some work. Actually, the last month's been really good. They've been productive and, and had a good run, basically, on these off-industrial parkway areas. So I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for, but I think that's where the criticism may be. Maybe. I just want an explanation. I appreciate, I appreciate your due diligence on it because they do need to do things properly. Uh, that's all I have. But one other thing I'd like to say to Paul, uh, Several months ago, we had a, a here, public hearing here on a, uh, a business that opened up at the corner of Lee Street and Brightleaf Boulevard, Truck Lane. And I was fearful that night of what I have seen since that time, but on numerous occasions I have been by that facility, there have been cars parked on the side of that building. And you know, we clearly made the owner, or I thought we made the owner understand that the right of way goes right to the edge of that building and there would be no parking. Now, uh, that was discussed that night. It was brought up, I believe, that there could be some issues with that, and there are issues with that. Uh, not every time I go by there, but the mayor's shaking his head. You've probably seen some cars parked over there also. My question is, we need to do something about it. And what can we do? Can we get the police department involved in it? Can we go in and box off that area so they can't park there? But uh, you know, the, the we were nice enough to allow those people to open that business, and I appreciate businesses in town. But they need to follow the rules. It has been. It has been an ongoing struggle. I will tell you that both the police, but primarily our code enforcement, has gone out there on several occasions and brought them the conditional use and said you can't do this. And, and on the one hand, giving the uh, business, um, I guess, tenant, uh, the business operator in that in that shop, it seems like they comply and they take care of it immediately at that time. It, it's cleaned up for a few days or, or a week or longer, and then it will come back in some level and he'll go back out there. I haven't heard recently um, the complaints, and we have gotten complaints from people I, I think in the area. Uh, I have brought to our attention, and as you mentioned, the mayor has also noticed it. And we have gotten some compliance. If you feel that, if you feel that's to a level where they're just not compliant, and we can definitely go to the next level of enforcement, which may include, you know, removing the ability to park there at all, well, whether by blockade well, or otherwise. If I were a customer of theirs, there's nothing there that tells me not to pull up on that side and park and go in. And my suggestion would be that we have either asked them or required them if we can to post some signage up there that says no parking or, or whatever. But you know, I, I can see how I as a 
citizen would just pull up there and go in that side door uh, and walk in and leave my truck. I've, I've seen more than one vehicle parked on the side there or appeared at times. So it's just something I wanted to bring to your attention. And if we will make sure, Brent, which I'm sure we will, keeps a log of those instances. That way you have some better attention. Anything else? If not, uh, I will entertain a, a motion to go into closed session for purposes of consulting with our attorney. Regretfully, <laughs> 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 <laughs>